Final segment this morning with Clint Kelly, malpractice attorney here in Middle Tennessee. It's good to have him with us, and uh, we can take some phone calls if you want to jump in, 737-7587. Now, Clint, again, too, um, whether you're dealing with a COVID case, and I know you have other cases as well, the heart of the matter when it comes down to it is the, the issue of negligence and whether or not the facility you're suing matched up with standard of care again. Now, and that's interesting when it comes to COVID because we, you know, you've got standard of care with how you treat someone after back surgery, how you've taught me about those pressure pracks on legs after surgery to keep you from having a stroke. The thing about COVID is we don't know necessarily, right, what the standard of care is. That line keeps moving as we learn new things about it. Does that make these cases more difficult? Yeah, it does. Um, I, I have not taken a COVID case other than the Galton Nursing Home cases because I just simply have not had a case to take that would be worthy. Uh, there are some people who do get sick, but the problem in most cases, Nick, is causation, proving that the person got it from the particular area where they want to claim right. they were infected, which kind of harkens back to why we need this legislation. There are no COVID cases, to my understanding, that are waiting to be filed or that are filed other than mine. I mean, I'm sure there's one here, there, and you know, and around but there's not some floodgate of litigation because lawyers understand people like myself it's going to be very hard to prove where you got it right you know, in the nursing home that's different because right. you can only get it one place but in hospitals or businesses it's going to be very hard to prove so uh, i think more than the standards changing is proving causation where you got it and if you can't prove that then you got no case i think you make an excellent point in fact then clint that makes me think that those who are in support of this legislation, I think you can get a sense, I'm not thrilled with it myself as a consumer, but that they're using COVID in a way to get this thing passed, but it's about something else. Cause you're right. I mean, I can get COVID tomorrow and I can try to claim, oh, well, I must've got it while I was at work here, which they do a terrific job at Scripps and I feel very safe here. But even if I want to make that claim, you know, I also was at Kroger yesterday and I also went by the YMCA yesterday. How can I prove where I was at? So I wonder if that legislation is about something else, because you're right. I mean, if people are lining up to file lawsuits, good luck proving it unless you're someone stuck in a nursing home. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head, Nick, and that, it concerns me too, because I know there's not a problem. I know there's not gonna be a problem, so what's the real purpose here? Right. Unless, like I said, this is just a big political payoff and lobbyists have to be um, somehow compensated for their time that they spent uh, getting legislation because we are in a campaign season. Maybe it's that, but it's not going to address it. I think of it basically it's a prescription for a problem that doesn't exist. Okay. Uh, you know, just since we have a little time left here in the program, I, I didn't want to spend the whole show talking necessarily about COVID. I know that's your focus right now with some of these very big right. cases, but I'm, I'm just wondering you, as you pay attention, um, is there anything else that's developed out there? We've talked about class actions. We've talked about those pressure packs that go on legs to avoid strokes, you know, backs. Is there anything else outside of COVID right now that is making news or that you think is taking a, a step in another direction with regard to malpractice cases? Sure. Um, let me tell you something that's going on in one of my cases, uh, which I think has a uh, uh, application for everybody. Uh, you know, you're always talking about what can we do to protect ourselves? And those are good questions. I've got a case right now involving a surgical first assistant. This is a person who doesn't go to medical school it's really someone who just graduates from high school, uh, learns a trade, if you will, which is how to assist a surgeon during surgery. They don't have licensure. Uh, they don't necessarily have certification. And this first surgical assistant has a drinking problem. Hmm. And he works for one of the main hospitals here in Nashville. And he relapsed repeatedly. And I asked him, how are you notifying the hospital about these relapses and what are they doing about it? And he was reporting the relapses haphazardly. In fact, he told me he drank a, he went two years of being sober and then drank a half a fifth of vodka and then didn't feel intoxicated, which of course everybody around the table looked at each other and realized that mm -hmm. this guy's got a serious problem. I believe he was probably impaired when he operated on my client, and my client was seriously injured, oh. seriously injured. Um, the surgeon has some responsibility, but it's the concern I have about the surgical assistant. And what I, I don't want to scare people, 
But what I want people to understand is if you're going to have any type of surgery or invasive procedure, I think it is very important for you to check with the hospital and ask them who's going to be the staff involved in the surgery and do any of them have alcohol problems. Now, let me tell you something. The hospital is not going to volunteer that information to you. I'll tell you that straight up. Right. But you're laying a marker so that if the surgeon or someone on that team knows that charted in your record is a concern about this, they may be more attuned to changes in behavior during the surgery that would lead them to question or perhaps exclude someone. And the reason I know this is there was a surgeon in a bedroom community around this town who used to show up for surgery drunk. And finally, they ran him off. One of the nurses just turned him around and walked him right out of the OR. Hmm. And this guy's not operating anymore in Tennessee. Sometimes that's what it takes to get rid of bad actors who consume alcohol and show up drunk on the job. You know, Clint, we've got a good, we have a good audience in this show, but not nearly a big enough audience that needs to hear what you just said. And, and you've told me before about always asking questions, but again, I, I always say I learned something from you when you come on. What person going in for surgery maybe quizzes the doctor a bit, but thinks to say, by the way, do any of the staff that are going to be assisting you have a drug or alcohol problem? And, and you're right, you can ask that, but then you're going to be on record that you asked it. If they say no, and then God forbid something bad happens, and then it comes back, not only did something bad happen, but they can see that you asked about it, then you've got them, right? Exactly. I mean, it, people look at medical records before proceeding with surgery as part of the timeout procedure. And when a note like that is in there that the patient has concern about someone on the staff uh, being uh, having a chemical dependency issue or alcohol dependency issue, that raises antennas. Uh, people are looking around and making sure that everyone is showing up sober. I, I, people don't, and yeah. they have no idea what goes on in the OR. Wow. They just don't. So you just, and, and it's, I mean, but you're no. saying you go ahead and ask that, Clint, even if you have no suspicion at all. You just say that. And by the way, when you do say that, when you ask that, who, who, do, you, who do you ask that to? And, and how is it that that is included on the file that's there for your case? When you come in and sign the consent form yeah. for the procedure, you don't want to stick that clipboard in your lap oh, okay. and say, fill all these out. Yeah. That's when you ask. You get the nurse in there gotcha. and you ask the nurse who's on my OR team. They're not gonna know, or they're not gonna tell you more than likely. But you go one step further and say, does anyone on this team have any chemical dependency issues or alcohol issues? And you write it on the consent form. I questioned about gotcha. addiction issues. You'd be amazed when someone looks at that form, because in surgery, that's all they're looking at, is part of your chart and your consent form to make sure you consent for the procedure. When they see that, they'll start looking around in that room and asking themselves that question and That's you just stuff. never know you might be that one person where that yeah. uh gets a person knocked out of the or who's under the influence that is really good stuff to know i had not thought of that and that that could have been at the heart in some degree of this case that you're working at right now that's still pending i imagine with regard to this surgical assistant huh yeah and there yeah. I, the truth of it is, Nick, there is a more than significant number of health care providers who work in surgery and are impaired. You've got to be kidding me. You, no, you're saying um, these guys are going into surgery or women and um, are on a narcotic or have had a, a, a couple of beers at lunch or whatever. And they, they go. I mean, it's like I try to think and I'm not my someone's life is not in my hands here as a reporter. I mean, I, I know I've done things to help folks, but I mean, it, I would not dream of coming to work impaired here and, and, and for a lot of good reasons. But to, to do that when you know you're going to be operating on someone's body? I mean, that, I guess the only reason you could justify that or not justify or explain it is that these people have serious addiction problems they can't control. Either that or they're just evil and don't give a damn. I don't think it's the latter. I think it's the former. And some of these people have mental health issues. But Nick, it's, it, it, doctors and nurses are no different than the rest of society. There are lawyers that show up drunk for work. There are police officers show up drunk for work or impaired. You know, they're, they're on narcotics or some other type of drug. It's everywhere else in society. So why would doctors and nurses be any different? No, you're that's right. what I want people to understand. Sure. And there are so, journalists uh, who...
Yeah. So that's well, what I would counsel people to do. Uh, that's just excellent. Excellent advice. And that's something I, I thought I knew it all after all these years you and I have been doing this, my friend. Uh, I remind folks where you're at and talk about what, you know, again, if they call your number and we'll put up that information for contact at the end of the show, but what they go through when they call if they think they have a case, Clint. Sure, they call uh, my phone number, which is 6158 million. That's 800 uh, Ask to speak to Michelle, uh, but they'll put you through to Michelle. She's the one that screens my calls. She gets the history from the potential clients. She passed that information to me. If I think the case has legs, I'll call the client up and then I'll schedule a meeting. We probably do it by Zoom these days. If I don't believe the claim has merit, I will write a letter to the client. I always write letters to every client I have, regardless whether I take the case or don't, telling them either why I don't take the case, or if I do take the case, obviously, then we go forward with it. The cost is zero. Client, I mean, client pays nothing unless I recover money for them. So like I said, it's one of the best deals you could possibly get you got nothing to lose and everything to gain. Yep, and like you said again, statute of limitation, one year. Don't sit on it, don't wait, because you may have a case and you can just lose it. Absolutely. Clint, you and I gotta get together, do a story again sometime. One of these juicy cases, come on. Yeah, it, you know, there's always gonna be one out there, it seems like they uh, find me. And one after another, and I know Jennifer will continue to work with you as we follow that case involving the Gallatin Nursing Home. Listen, Clint, thanks uh, so much for joining us today. Really appreciate it, love uh, the conversation. Give my best to your father as well, would you? I'll do that. Thank you, Nick. All right. Take care, sir. We'll see Clint Kelly again in uh, another month. And in the meantime, we're going to take a break, come back. I'll have a programming note about tomorrow, as well as you heard Clint say, yeah, the number you can remember, 8 million. But I'm going to give you the contact and where his office is located right after this. Stay with us.